It can be open in Romans 7. We'll begin our studies there. Uh, just came to mind also the co worker asked for prayer for. He does have cancer for certain. He started his treatment. They think they got early, but still pray for him because he, as I mentioned, he does not know the Lord. Amen. But Romans chapter 7 will begin, and <clears throat> Lord willing, look at the first four verses today. We call our studies in chapter 6 dealt largely with our relationship to sin and to righteousness. How that we are dead to sin, how that we shouldn't be living the life of sin anymore. How that later on, you they reiterate over and over again how that we either are the servants of righteousness or the servants of sin. We either serve God or we serve unrighteousness. There's no in between. Amen. Romans chapter 7, verses 1 through 4 say, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Is it bad? You hear we have this... <clears throat> picture of marriage is, I don't think Paul is meaning this to be a comprehensive lesson on marriage by any means, but he used that as a picture of our relationship to the law and to Christ. Mm -hmm. And begins by saying, you know you not, brethren. And we've seen that phrase before. It's, we would say, don't y'all know? Mm -hmm. Know you not? You should know this, brethren. That is, he is speaking to the <laughs> saved. He's not just speaking to everyone, but because the saved are the ones who should know these things. He says, for I speak to them that know the law. Now certainly the Gentile Romans knew about Roman law. Surely they had a good understanding of Roman law and what it meant to be a good citizen. Well, that was a pretty important thing to be a Roman was, was to be a good citizen of Rome. But I believe he is addressing primarily the Jewish Romans here and how they should know the Mosaic Law. Mm -hmm. if you recall there was a large number of Jews in Rome. They were expelled during, I think it was Claudius' reign. That's why Aquila and Priscilla went to Corinth. <laughs> right. But by this time I believe many had returned as we see through all throughout the book of Romans, he addresses the Jews at times. Some have theorized that the Jews had a hard time reintegrating with the Gentile believers when they came back to Rome, and that's why he oftentimes addresses them here in this book. But here he'll speak about the Mosaic law and regarding marriage. He says, For I speak to them that know the law, how that the law had to mean over man as long as he lived. Because man is bound by law his entire life, isn't he? Amen. Yeah. Whether you want to talk about the moral laws of God, the Mosaic law, the Old Testament, the governmental laws, or even just the natural laws, man is bound by the law for as long as he lived. Mm -hmm. We have laws in America and we must abide by them. And if you go to another country, you better abide by their laws. Or you be sure Mexico will definitely lock you up. Right. <laughs> Most of those Middle Eastern countries will throw you in jail. North Korea will lock you up if you're American and probably never let you go. Right. A man is bound by the laws wherever he goes. And even if we were to go to a deserted island, the laws of nature would still constrain us. So. He's going to use this picture here of how that we, in our natural state, are 
bound to the law of God. Mm -hmm. As long as we live in the old man, we are under obligation to God's law. That's right. And you might say, well, what about Romans 6.14? I quoted that several times in the last bit of our studies here. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. See, that is, before we were saved, we were under the law. But now that we are in Christ, we are no longer under the law. So we'll see in Romans 2 taught us that even the Gentiles who had not the law, they, they did the things in that were contained in the law, and they became a law unto themselves. Amen. That every man has the moral law of God written in their hearts. That it says in that place their conscience bearing witness against them. That every man has that understanding, if you will, of right versus wrong, that with, written on their hearts and their conscience. Mm -hmm. And though a man has been corrupted by sin, his understanding of those things is not always right because of his sinful nature, yet man is bound by the law of God so as long as he lives. Amen. So we can come to the conclusion that we must die to be free from the law. And that's what Paul will bring out here in our next few verses. You know, we won't turn their relations for verses four and five tells that in the process of time that Christ came and he died to deliver those who were under the law. Mm -hmm. You and I, we were under the law. Whether we <coughs> were Jews or whether we were Gentiles, without the grace of God applied in lives, we were obligated to keep the full law of God. Amen. And you can be sure for all those who are not saved and you if you die in your sins, you will stand before God and give account for why you do not keep the law. You shall be judged according to the law of God and found wanting. Verse 2, though, we'll go on here. He says, For the woman which hath a husband, so here he begins to show this picture of a woman in her relationship to her husband, specifically under the Mosaic law. Now, there's a whole bunch of laws regarding marriage in the Mosaic covenant, but Two things to note that men were allowed to have more than one wife under the Mosaic law. In fact, in some places it was commanded. And yet women were not allowed to divorce their husbands under Mosaic law. Now they could annoy their husbands to the point that he put her away, but by Mosaic law, only the man had the right to give a bill of divorcement. But we know from the beginning it was not so. The, right. God's original design for marriage was to be one man, one woman for life. But sin corrupted that. So therefore God gave laws commanding those situations. And even in the New Testament, Christ and Paul both deal with those things. It says, For the woman that hath the woman which hath the husband is bound by the law to her husband, so as long as he liveth. As because of us, we noted that the woman could not divorce her husband at that time. She had to remain with him his entire life and be faithful to him. And that was our natural state with the law. That is what Paul was showing us here, that until Christ comes in our life, until he saves us, until, he, until we die to the law, we are bound to that law as long as we live. Amen. We are bound to keep it. We're bound to be faithful to it. We're bound to be obedient to that law. Just as a woman is bound to be obedient to her husband under the Mosaic law as long as her husband was alive. Uh, that sounds, in our modern American culture, that sounds pretty rough. But if one was to live fully in the guidelines of the Bible, then that is the perfect situation. Mm -hmm. Amen. Problem, as I said already, though the sin always corrupts things and always messes up the perfect picture of which and the perfect design of God. But for the woman which hath a husband is bound by the law of her husband, so as long as he liveth. No, no more than the woman could free herself from her husband, neither could we free ourselves from the law. 
We could not fulfill its obligations on our own. We really we could not even be fully obedient to it as we ought to. But yet without Christ we are obligated to be fully obedient to the law. Amen. So there even in the New Testament there does seem to be at least two exceptions that that are allowed for, but you know, that's not part of our message today, but just so you you have in Matthew 19, 9, and 1 Corinthians 7, 15, to deal with divorce and absolution of marriage in certain situations. But generally speaking, death is what ends a marriage. Right. It's in, only by death can we be free from our, quote, marriage to the law. It says, but if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. Mm -hmm. And then she is no longer bound to that husband that died, and she is free to marry another. We, widows are free to remarry, as we see in several places. Oh. 1 Corinthians 7, verses 8 and 9, Paul deals with the widows and the unmarried. And he says it's, he would if they would be unmarried, but if they cannot contain themselves, let them marry. 1 Timothy 5, verse 11, Paul seems to strongly suggest that the younger widows will, will want to remarry. Mm -hmm. well, there's nothing wrong with this widow being remarried, and we, in a spiritual sense, are... I've been widowed to the law, and as we'll see, you are married to Christ. Let's go on to verse number three here. He says, For, So then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. If this woman who was married and then gets remarried under the Mosaic law, she was considered an adulteress. Mm -hmm. who has not been faithful to her husband sexually yet under the Mosaic law that sin is worthy of death mm -hmm. and that is one thing under in the New Testament age and in the age of grace that we sometimes forget I think is there's many things which we can be guilty of and sometimes are guilty of yet under the Old Testament law those things just require death. Mm -hmm. but adultery was one of those things that required to be stoned to death if you were found guilty. Yet if a woman were to marry another while her husband liveth, she would be an adulteress. Mm -hmm. That's why we, we cannot be married both to Christ and to the law. We cannot be have two masters that we saw back in chapter 6. We cannot serve the one and the other. We will either serve the one and hate the other. We will love the one and despise the other. And so it is with a woman and her husband. She cannot be married to two and expect to please both of them. And spiritually, we cannot be married to Christ and to sin or to Christ and to the law either and expect to be pleasing to both of them. Amen. So then, while her husband lives, she be married to another, she shall be called an adulteress. In fact, Christ said when he gives his, when he addresses marriage and remarriage and divorce, he says that lest it be for the cause of fornication, if the woman gets remarried, then she shall be guilty of adultery. Said we're not going to get all into the details of what of marriage today because that's not the point of what Paul is teaching here. But we see that is a good picture of our spiritual state that we can be guilty of spiritual adultery, we can be guilty mm -hmm. of spiritual fornication, and yet neither of those are pleasing to God any more than the physical. Going on here to the next part of our verse it says but if her husband be dead she is free from that law and she is no longer bound to that husband that died she is free to remarry at that point 
She is free from that law, it says. Mm -hmm. Said we know that widows were allowed to be remarried even under the Mosaic covenants. In fact, I find one law a bit interesting regarding that is if your brother died, you had to marry his wife. Mm -hmm. so I feel sorry for Sarah if Adam were to die under the Mosaic covenant because she had to marry Matthew. <laughs> no, that was the, the law to keep to keep the tribes going was, and to keep marriage I'm trying to, try to say to keep the, them pure and, and not go out into the world and make sure they were taken care of as well because mm -hmm. if you know the widows were very poor at that time they didn't, especially if they didn't have someone to help take care of them mm -hmm. that is why the New Testament church is supposed to take care of widows if they're right, right. especially if they are widows indeed, as it says. But all of this we know that well, we see that it is a type of the marriage vow that we often repeat today, till death do you part. It says, if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. So she is free to marry another, just as we, being dead to the law, are free to marry another. First four, where we'll, we'll pick up on the application part of this, now that he's shown us the picture, and how that under the law, that woman was bound her entire life, or her husband's entire life. We got to be dead, she was free to marry another. Yet he says, wherefore, in verse 4, now we begin to see the picture of this, put into application now that we were once married to the law, now we are going to be free to marry another, which is Christ. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are dead to the law by the body of Christ. He, he, again, he addresses my brethren. He's speaking to the, to the saved here, because that is important, because the unsaved are still bound to the law. Right. But we that are saved, we have been free from the law. We are no longer under the law, but under grace. He says, you are become dead to the law, dead to its power, dead to its guilt, dead to its penalty. Amen. And as he's building up to a point later in the chapter, we're also dead to its obligations and rituals. Mm -hmm. We that are saved can no longer be condemned by the law because we are dead to it. That should be a, a source of comfort for the child of God, that the law can no longer condemn us. Amen. But we that are in Christ, we, though again we are guilty of breaking the law, yet we will not be condemned by that law. That's what we'll see very, very plainly in chapter 8. Amen. We are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. It was through the, the person of our Lord Jesus Christ and his death and his perfect obedience to the law, fulfilling even every type and prophecy as well. Mm -hmm. But in him we have become dead to the law. If you remember back in Romans chapter 6, we talked about how we have been or how we are dead with Christ, how baptism is a picture of us dying with Christ and being buried and rising in the third day. Over in Galatians chapter 2, verse 19, he says that we are dead to the law, that we should live unto God. Verse 20, we probably know that one more. It says that I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. You bet. For he says, Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Mm -hmm. In Christ we died, in Christ we now live. In Christ, we die to the law. And because we are now dead to the law, he said that you should marry another. That you, that you should be married to another. That we can, we are now not just free from the law, but we are free to marry another. Or be united with Christ is what we'll ultimately what he's getting at here. We were 
Just like a woman was bound to her husband, we were bound to the law. Yet when the husband died, she is free from that law. So that we being dead in Christ are free from the law as well. Amen. So we, he did not just free us from the law to do whatever we want to, though, did he? Mm -hmm. He did not just leave us as a widow and make us spend for ourselves. But in dying to the law and being free from the law, he is, for lack of a better way of putting it, we now have the opportunity to be married unto Christ. Mm -hmm. That you should be married to another, even to him that is raised from the dead. That is, of course, our Lord Jesus Christ. As Revelation 1 18 describes him, he that liveth and was dead is alive forevermore. And we know that he is the one who was raised by the power of God the third day. And he ever liveth to make intercession for the saints. He has sat down on the right hand of God at this time. It is he that we are to be married to, we are saved. It is he that we are to be united to, you might say, made one with. Mm -hmm. And in the same way that a woman is bound to be obedient to her husband, we are bound to, obedient, to be obedient to Christ. Mm -hmm. The difference being, as I think he'll bring out later on in this chapter, though, is that the law was a bit of a tyrannical type husband, and yet Christ is a very loving type husband. Amen. The law demanded perfect obedience, didn't it? The law demanded no room for error, and if there was, then death was penalty. And yet Christ is gracious and merciful, and he's long-suffering. That would, that's what's the difference between forced obedience and loving we follow him. You know? Right. I think that is where the difference is between those who strive for good works and those who serve God because they love him. The difference between those who try to keep the law for righteousness sake and those who just want to please God. Because as he says in the next part from the end of our text here that we should bring forth fruit unto God. The part of our purpose of us being united with Christ that we can bring fruit to God. Mm -hmm. well, as we've seen already, all of us are bringing some sort of fruit. Matthew 7, verses 17 through 18 says that a corrupt tree brings forth corrupt fruit and a good tree brings forth good tr fruit. Uh, Amen. A corrupt tree cannot bring forth good fruit and a good tree cannot bring forth corrupt fruit. You're going to bring forth one fruit, whether it be good or whether it be evil. But in the person of Christ, we can bring forth good fruit unto God. And really, if we have truly been saved, we ought to bring forth fruit unto God. Mm -hmm. Again, that goes back to the, the reason why we do good works, the reason why we serve God. If it's out of quote, just obligation or routine or because we feel we are forced to and we're not doing it for the right reasons. Let's go over to John chapter 15, though, for a moment. So the so the law is almost like a, a slave master driving us to obedience. Yet in Christ we have great liberty. We don't have that slave master driving us anymore. Yet he says that we're supposed to use that liberty not for an occasion to the flesh, but by love to serve one another. Amen. That was no John 15, verse 16. And we actually gives lots of commandments about following him in this particular passage. 
Verse 12 says, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Verse 14, You are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Notice verse 16, though, he says, You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go forth and bring forth, or you should go and bring forth fruit that your fruit should remain. And whatsoever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Amen. Part of our call as Christians is to bring forth fruit unto God. He says he chose us and ordained us, or to set it in order, if you will, that we should bring forth fruit. In Mark chapter 4, turn there before we close. You know the parable of the sower, some were sown on good ground, some were sown on thorns, some on stony ground, some fell by the wayside. And he gives the he expounds upon that. Those that were by the wayside, or those that, as soon as the seed was sown, Satan came and devoured it, that they would, so they wouldn't believe. Those among the stony ground sprung up and withered away immediately. And those among the weeds were choked out by the fear and riches of this world, that they shouldn't bring forth any fruit. But those verse 20 here, it says, and these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word and receive it and bring forth fruit. Those he didn't say, and they, and they might bring forth fruit, did he? And bring forth fruit, some 60, 30 fold, some 60, and some 100. Amen. All those who were, have the good ground, all those who have truly been born again, they will bring forth fruit. He says some, some will bring forth different amounts than others, though. Not everyone's going to bring for the same amount of fruit as you know, myself or Brother Larry. Or I'd say if we compared ourselves to some of the well-known saints of old, we would fall very short, wouldn't we? Right. And we're preaching here to just a handful today and teaching here today and singing songs of worship to God just 20 or so here and yet you know, our brother Spurgeon preached to crowds of thousands of times. Mm -hmm. You know, Paul had a very fruitful ministry, and who knows how many people were right. saved as a direct result of his preaching, much less the law that is written by him in the scriptures. We should bring forth fruit, but we should we should be careful to put down others that don't bring forth as much fruit as we do. If you're not bringing forth good fruit unto God, I would examine yourselves to see if you really have what you say you have. Because mm -hmm. scriptures are very clear that those who have been saved, those who are now united with Christ, they will bring forth fruit unto God. Mm -hmm. We have been free from the law and all its obligations, all its rituals that went along with it. We are free from that perfect obedience that it required. And yet that freedom should drive us to serve him more. Mm -hmm. Amen. It should, the fact that Christ has liberated us from those that heavy yoke and that bondage which we cannot bear, the scripture says, yet we should willfully and gladly serve him. He says, his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Mm -hmm. so, you know, I do believe one day Christ is going to come back as a ruling reigning king and he says he's going to rule with a rod of iron. Amen. But in this dispensation in which we live, we have great liberty in Christ. Yeah. And we should use that liberty to serve him more faithfully. We should we oftentimes use that freedom in Christ to do what we want to do, though, rather than what we ought to do. And that that's the exact opposite of why he gave us liberty. It wasn't to live as we want to, but it's to live as we ought to. <laughs> it's not to be burdened down by the requirements of the law, but it's freedom that we should serve him 
and follow him in everything that he tells us to do. Amen. And that is the great benefit of being, quote, married to Christ. I'm not going to get into the bride and all that and what awaits in the future for us, but in this sense, we are married to Christ. We are united to him and we are dead to the law. So let's not be like the, the ones on the other, one hand that are legalistic and try to tell you you got to do all this and do that in order to be saved, like the Church of Christ. Let's not go all the way to the other hand and just have this feel good, do whatever you want type right. service for God. We are his servants and we are, in this sense, his bride and we are to be obedient to him as a master and as a husband. Amen. Yeah, we wouldn't close with that thought.